There we go. That's a little better. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so thank you for joining us today uh, and welcome. Uh, for those who might not know me, as Kieran introduced me, I'm Todd Shank and I have the pleasure and honor to serve as Jess's CEO. Um, I first wanna thank Debbie Hedges, Deborah Adler and Kieran Dixit for pulling together this event and to our distinguished speakers, Pinchas Gutter and Alan Moskin for agreeing to participate in this program. It's really important for our community to take part in this international recognition of Holocaust Remembrance Day. It was on this date in 1945 that the camps of Auschwitz and Birkenau were liberated by Soviet troops. And in November of 2005, the United Nations designated January 27th an annual International Day of Commemoration in memory of the victims of the Holocaust. And further, they urged nations to develop educational programs that would inculcate future generations with the lessons of the Holocaust in order to help prevent future acts of genocide. So one purpose of this date of remembrance is to educate ourselves about the circumstances that led to and the consequences of the Holocaust so that we can prevent future generations from falling victim to ideologies of hatred. As genocide and atrocities keep occurring across the world, and as we've witnessed a rise in anti-Semitism, hate crimes, and hate speech, including the very recent hostage taking in a Fort Worth, Texas synagogue, this remembrance and education has never been so relevant. It's also important to recognize, as this program today reminds us, that survivors of the Holocaust are here in our community and around the globe. So while we are recalling a historical event and its lessons, there's also a present day need and responsibility for our community to support and ensure the dignity of survivors. Through Jess's Holocaust Survivor Program, we're privileged and humbled to carry out this sacred commitment in partnership with our community and the generosity of many important funders, including the Claims Conference, the Jewish Federation of Greater Washington, state and local government, as well as many caring donors across our area. I look forward to an important discussion that Kieran Dixit, Jess's Director of Training, will facilitate with our speakers. First, Debbie Hedges, Jess's Director of our Aging in Place Service Department, and Deborah Adler, the manager of Jess's Holocaust Survivor Program, will introduce our guests. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much, Todd. It is my pleasure to introduce to you all Pincus Guter. Pincus Guter is a survivor of six German Nazi concentration camps who now lives in Toronto, Canada. He was born in Wutz in 1932 into a Hasidic family of winemakers. When the war started, Pincus, along with his parents and twin sister, fled to Warsaw, where they were confined in the Warsaw ghetto for two and a half years. They were captured in April 1943 and deported to Monek death camp in occupied Poland. The Nazis murdered Pincus's father, mother, and sister upon arrival. Pincus was later sent to a succession of camps. He was liberated by the Soviet army from the camp and ghetto in Nazi-occupied Czechoslovakia, known as Thesserent, in May 8, 1945. After the war, 13-year-old Pincus was taken to an orphanage in England. He later moved to Paris to live with a cousin and left for Israel in 1950, where he volunteered for the army. After three years in the army and a stint working for a textile factory, he attended school to learn Hebrew. As a student, he met his wife, Dorothy, and they moved to England there, moved to England and married there. They later moved to Dorothy's native South Africa where they lived until 1985, when they moved and settled in Toronto. Pincus and Dorothy have two daughters and a son. 
Pincus is an active member of his community, serving as a cantor in his synagogue, and still speaks and shares his story today. Welcome, Pincus, and thank you so much for being with us today. Deborah? It's my pleasure to introduce Alan Moskan, Esquire. Mr. Moskin served in the U.S. Army during World War II from September 1944 to August 1946. On May 4, 1945, his company participated in the liberation of the Gunskirchen concentration camp, a subcamp of Mauthausen in Austria. After the war, Allen continued to serve in Wells, Austria until June 1946 as a member of the U.S. Army of Occupation. Today, he is a dedicated speaker about his U.S. Army experiences and is an eyewitness to the Holocaust in Europe in the hopes of promoting greater understanding and tolerance in our world for future generations. Alan Moskin was born in Englewide, New Jersey in 1926. He did his undergraduate work at Syracuse University and graduated from NYU Law School with a JD degree in June, 1951. Mr. Moskin practiced as a civil trial attorney for over 20 years and subsequently worked in the private business sector until he retired in 1991. In 1994, after 25 years of not speaking to anyone about his wartime experiences, Mr. Moskin was invited to speak to a group about his experiences as an infantry combat soldier and a witness to and liberator of the Nazi concentration camps in Europe during World War II. Mr. Moskin is a past commander of the Rockland Orange District Council of the Jewish War Veterans of the USA, was inducted into the New York State Veterans Hall of Fame in 2016, and was elected by the Veterans Coordinating Council in Rockland County, New York at, the at that time as the Veteran of the Year. He serves as a vice president on the board of trustees of the Holocaust Museum in Suffern, New York, volunteers at naturalization ceremonies, and is a source of support through peer-to-peer -peer counseling for U.S. veterans and their families. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Alan Moskin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah and Debbie. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Kieran. I'm very honored to be able to facilitate this conversation with both Pinkhas and Krista. Um, as some of you may know, Jessa has embarked on the diversity, equity, and inclusion journey towards being a just organization. What I want to start with today is to hear from both your perspective and from your experience about why you think it is important for us as a healthcare organization and as a Jewish organization to focus and promote diversity and equity and inclusion. Starting with Pinkas, how has your experience shaped how you think people from diverse backgrounds should be treated? Well, I would just, uh, first of all, I'd like to say hello to everybody who's listening. And secondly, to answer your question, the way I feel about it is, you know, people talk about tolerance. And I find that to tolerate is okay, but it's not enough. That if you tolerate people, you make a kind of, you, you make a, a, a decision. It's a, it's a subjective decision you tolerate. I, I want to, I strive when I speak to people all over the world and, and others, I try to strive to get them to accept. They accept everybody as they are. It doesn't matter what kind of color, what kind of religion, what kind of ethnicity, wherever they come from, we are all human beings. And I would like that, that humanity should accept each other as they are, because basically it doesn't matter what the signs are, from example, whether you have a Morgan David, a Star of David, or you have a cross, or you have a crescent, or you have something else. Basically, you look at it, but it's a representative of the one God. There's only one God. It doesn't matter whether you're a Buddhist or whatever. So I feel it is very important to tell people 
about my experiences, in other words, what happened, what shouldn't be happening now, because at the moment, there's an enormous amount of strife. You know, we, we look at the television and we see all these scenes about Rohingya, about Rwanda, Kosovo, and every, Syria. I mean, it doesn't matter wherever you, you look, you, you see refugees trying to, uh, yesterday there was on the, on the news, people are dying trying to flee places where they, they can't live. And I wanted to stop. And this is why I speak and I try to uh, convey to people exactly what happened to me, what shouldn't happen now, what we should educate the future, our children and everybody, what they should do in the future so the world can be a better place. Thank you, Pinkas. Um, Alan, from your perspective, um, and first of all, I know exactly where you are because I used to live in White Plains, so you're on the other side of the Tappan Zee, so okay. Nanuet and Suffern, that brought back a lot of memories. Um, so I'm so glad you're here, and I um, wanted to ask you from your perspective as um, someone that was involved in liberation, you know, wh wh why do you think it should be important um, to focus on fairness and equity? Um, and, and how can we make sure that we are passing this on to the next generation? Well, I wanted to say good morning to everybody, as big as has already said. And by the way, I agree 100% with what Pink has just said. Um, I'm, I'm, number one, very upset about really what's going on, apparently, again today, and what I hear in the news and that apparently anti-Semitism is alive and kicking again. And uh, after what I saw as a young American soldier and liberator, uh, we thought that, uh, thank heavens, what we accomplished back in World War II as liberating soldiers, uh, something like this would never happen again. And uh, I'm starting to feel uh, a little nervous about what's going on in the world again with the rise of anti-Semitism and, and the murder of so many innocent human beings all over the, the globe. And, uh, uh, you know, you talk about diversity. I was very fortunate that uh, when I was born and raised in New Jersey, uh, I lived in a very diverse area. And I played ball with... Uh, colored boys are now called black. I, when I was a kid, the word was uh, colored, but uh, uh, we went to school together. Uh, we played ball together. Uh, there was Irish and Italian and Jews like myself, Catholics, Protestants. I never even thought about the difference in religion or the difference in one's skin. And it was quite shocking to me to find out later that many, uh, Many young people never had the opportunity to, to grow up in a very diverse area and never really mingled with people of, 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 of different color or different religion. I felt that also in basic training in the South where I encountered uh, a way back uh, uh, a, a bit of a personal, with the racial inequality down the South in the 1940s was really something I, we, I never encountered before and it was a shock. And uh, uh, I think diversity is it's something that we, we have to emphasize, but it's difficult for people who never grew up in a diverse community to, to understand that we all feel uh, joy, we all feel sadness. I always remember what uh, one, one of my favorite people who passed away a number of years, years ago, Maya Angelou, uh, one of the things she said was, uh, People are more more alike uh, uh, than different, or uh, and I like I always like to remember that that doesn't matter what the color of your skin is or what your religion is, we all feel joy, we all feel pain, and uh, it was easy for me to understand that as a kid. But I found out, unfortunately, uh, particularly in the South in the forties, that many of the younger people. You know, didn't have the opportunity to grow up with people of different 
color or different religion. And, and it was a shock to them to, to see things. Uh, when I put a, a post behind my bunk of our basketball team, uh, three colored boys, myself and my Catholic buddy, uh, with our arms around each other. And the Southern boys didn't take kindly to that. That was quite a shock to me initially in America that everybody uh, didn't have the same feelings that I did. Uh, and I, I was so fortunate to grow up that way. And then of course, what I saw as a liberator, the concentration camp was so horrific that it was hard for me to even put a handle on it. Uh, uh, I just couldn't believe that there were people that would treat other people like that. And uh, it sort of shook me up and made me feel that I got to get out there and speak to the young people in particular about what I saw and, the, and the, the truth about what the Nazis did, because uh, it, it's, it's, un, it's, it's un, unbelievable to me that there are so many people out there today again saying that, oh, the Holocaust uh, was exaggerated, there were no six million and this and that. And, uh, and it rankles me to, to see that there are still so much anti-Semitism out there today. And, I'm trying to do my best to get the word out that uh, uh, there was a Holocaust and the young people got to make darn sure that what I saw and what Pinkus went through never happens again. And that's why I hope to continue to speak as long as God gives me the strength. 95 and counting, so I don't know how long I got, but I'm going to keep shooting as long as I can to get the word out to uh, all the young people. They got to do the job with people like Pinkus and myself were gone and say, hey, I heard from somebody that was there, the Holocaust happened and we got to make darn sure it never happens again. Um, uh, Alan, what branch of the military were you in? I was in the uh, infantry on the General Pat, Third Army, and we fought the Rhineland campaign, Central European campaign against the Nazis. Uh, and I emphasized uh, well, one of the shocking things that we found also is that uh, there was a group called the Hitler Jugend, the Deutsche Mesa. These were young, very young teenagers who were fighting against us and, and the hate that they had. Uh, I always emphasize that fighting the Nazis, uh, I had no problem, uh, so to speak, with the Wehrmacht. I was a regular German army. They were fighting in a war like we were fighting in a war. But the Nazis and the Hit and the Hitler Jugend were the ones that were full of hate. And I always said, hate begets hate. Uh, get, I tell these young people that I speak to all over the country now, get rid of the hate. You know, hate begets hate. Learn to love each other and, and hug each other and forget the hate. And I saw enough hate with the Hitler Youth and the Waffen SS and, and, and Reich will be no end. And I, I want to make sure that the young people uh, get get rid of the hate. You don't want to hate anybody. You want don't want to disagree. Okay, you want to argue. Okay, but forget about the hate. I always tell my grandchildren and others, don't even hate your vegetables. What the vegetables do to you? Don't hate. You know. So uh, it's hard to make light of it, but uh, uh, I'm I'm a hugger now, and I got a thing going about it. hug, don't hate to the young people that I speak to. And, you know, it's amazing. I did that years ago and just came out of me and said, boy, I'm a hugger. Why can't we hug you? All the kids came up to me later on, big hug. And when you hug, you got a smile on your face. And uh, now I got letters from some of the kids in the school. Mr. Moskin, we formed a, a Hug Don't Hate Club in your honor. If they want to put that on my tombstone when, I, when I'm gone, I, uh, I'll be a happy camper. Thank you, um, Alan. As you both go around the world talking to different groups, what is the one thing that surprises you the most? I know that you speak to young people, you've spoken to adults. Is there anything that surprises you? Think well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll throw in and then I'll take this because I'm going to be blabbing here all the time. But my main concern is that. Uh, uh, a lot of the young people don't seem to know much about the Holocaust and the schools don't seem to be emphasizing it enough in my judgment, particularly of late. Uh, you know, I, uh, 
I speak to some of the teachers when we, after I speak at lunch, we have a break and, uh, and I say, Hi, and they, some of them tell me that they get a curriculum from uh, New York, from Albany, and from Jersey, from Trenton. They have to follow the curriculum, so to speak, the outline. And there's maybe one page or two pages about World War II and the Holocaust. I said, my God, you got to put more time on it. You know, as time goes on, they say, well, it's a long time ago. And I, I say, well, I don't care how long it is. You learn from history. That's what, you know, that's, that's what it's all about. You make sure that what happened back then doesn't happen again. And I'm a little, little concerned about the, in some of the schools or the lack of knowledge, not all, but some of the schools, some of the kids don't have much knowledge of what really happened back in World War II or the Holocaust. And uh, I, I want to get the word out that you got to, you know, you learn from history. That's what it's all about. You make sure what happened back then never happens again. That's my concern when I go out or in various places that uh, many of the young people in particular, even some of the seniors, don't seem to know enough about the, the extent of what happened back in, uh, in World War II and the concentration camps. And uh, uh, I would say that's the thing that hits me. And, uh, you know, I, I want to see that corrected. Is that I do the best I can, and I'm sure Pink is getting out there, does the same thing, you know. But uh, that's the, my, my main concern. You know, I don't want them to forget what happened back then. You learn from history, you make sure what happened back then never happens again. Um, the problem at the moment with the education is that uh, we don't teach children, students, others. We don't teach them humanities. What we do is because of the IT and the emphasis on uh, if you're going to want to earn a living, you'll have to learn IT and engineering and so forth and so on, then you, you have to exercise that. So, Basically, when I, uh, am, when I go to a school or university and I speak to them, I try to emphasize the part of, of, of the history. So I don't only talk about the Holocaust. I speak to them about general what went on before the war, uh, what happened during the war, and as I said before, uh, to, so to be able to enlighten them about what is going on, and I also speak about what is going on at the moment, depending the time that I have. But basically, uh, to to me, what is in, what is very important is the aspect of how it is accepted, and I always find that it is it's a, it's 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 so cathartic for me that when I am. Um, when I am in, in, in front of an audience, the empathy that I get from them once they start listening to what I have to speak to them and what I'm trying to teach them or talk to them about is quite significant from the point of view that I have been going on trips. I've been back now to Poland and Germany over 20 times with different uh, people, people like um, Catholic University professors. Uh, I've been from New Jersey, from the College of St. Elizabeth, with students from the different Seton Hall and others. I've been, uh, I spoke at Harvard, I spoke at the United Nations. And the fact is that what, what the response that you get is so cathartic to you as a human being, as, as a survivor of the Holocaust, as a witness of what happened, that to me, it really, I mean, the first time that I went uh, with, with the New Jersey group of uh, a bishop, nuns, Catholic educators from a Catholic universities, and the, the, the empathy that they gave me, and especially to somebody like me, who has suffered at the hands of mainly, you know, coming from Poland, mainly from Catholic people, and during the war, of course, from German Catholics or, or basically from Christians. And, uh, and, and to me, to be able to be so enveloped by so much love and empathy, uh, you know, I'm just repeating myself, by these human beings, 
is very, very much important to me and it's important, I think, to the world as such. And what I try to do generally is to try and create a climate of goodwill. For example, I will tell you, before I finish my speech, but at the end of my, whatever I'm talking about, my experiences, some people call it stories, but these are not stories. This is something that you went through and you kind of share it with people. So I give them a gift and my gift is a torch. The torch is like an Olympic torch. The Olympic torch has only got one flame, a flame of goodwill amongst athletes that they should compete correctly without, without kind of uh, fighting or anything like that and jealousy and try and be create goodwill amongst the games of the Olympic games going back to Athens. But my torch, I carry a torch with me all the time. And my torch has got more than one flame. It's got lots of flames. And I'll just give you an example of some of them. So my flames is, for example, no racial discrimination, no religious discrimination, no xenophobia, no homophobia, and above all, no hate. Hate is vicious, it's pernicious, it creates vengeance, and I would hand this over to the audience, whoever is listening, and I say, you've got part of me, I'm also giving you a gift of this flame. I would like you to take this flame, carry it, hand it over to whoever you can, to your families, to your friends, and create a light in the world, just like the sun is shining, create the light. Instead of the darkness, create lightness and make the world a better place. So to me, when I, when, I, when I find I speak to people, I find it's very satisfactory from my point of view that I get a response. And the response that I feel both emotionally and through osmosis, that, that something is actually happening. And, the, and it's true because I get responses from people. For example, the other day, I, uh, somebody who's working uh, very, very up as in the ministry of uh, Nova Scotia in one of the provinces of Canada. It, she was with me in 2009 on a march of remembrance and hope in Poland and Germany. And she arranged for the civil servants in Nova Scotia, 150 of them, to listen to me and talk to them a few days ago. So this is continuously, it does permeate the, the people and it creates Holocaust, that's what Holocaust survivors try and do. They all try to be witnesses, to try and bring up about a situation, a climate where the world is getting better. Maybe drop by drop slowly, but it is definitely getting better. I'm an optimist. I believe things are improving. The fact is in Canada, according to the news that we get, and I believe it's true, we took in 30,000 Syrian refugees. Now, in 1930s, when the Jews were struggling in Germany, and then later on, in, things tried, Jews tried to get out of Eastern Europe and everywhere. All the doors were closed. Only one country in the world, there was an Evian conference, and only the Dominican Republic allowed Jews to come to, as, 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 as immigrants. Everybody else talked a lot. But we, all the doors were closed. There's even, there's even a, a song in, in Yiddish that, where should I go? All the doors are locked. You know, what, what resonates with me and perhaps with a lot of people in the audience is, is your optimism, um, given what you've experienced. Uh, and it's very humbling uh, to hear from you of how you continue to have hope and pass on this message of light and love and, and from both of you, Alan um, and Pinchas, uh, to encourage people to you know, not hate and to get to know each other and spread this um, lightness of being together. So um, thank you, that, that is very powerful and very moving. Um, what, what do you want your descendants, what do you want young people particularly to understand about the Holocaust? about your experience as you go to schools, as you speak to young people, um, what is it that you share with them and what do you want them to um, hold on to? Basically, as far as I'm concerned, 
uh, I would like humanity as a whole to not just speak about the Holocaust such. When they speak about the Jewish people, especially, you know, I am a religious Jew. We have a history going back to Abraham, which is approximately three and a half thousand years. And I want to tell them about the culture and what happened, you know, before the war. What was the, 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 the huge uh, literature and everything else, the life of the Jews over the few thousand years, the culture that they should continue. You know, there's always, you know, we, we suffered a lot over the thousands of years, but I believe in God and God, God always really, uh, uh, make sure there is a remnant and the remnant must continue to keep the traditions of Judaism, to keep the traditions of the history of what the Jewish people actually brought about in the world. I mean, we don't exist for all these years just because it so happened. I mean, if you look at the Bible, if you look at the Quran, which if you look, to, if you look at even the New Testament and the Old Testament, which, which Christians all study and believe in, all the morality, all, all the teachings, all the just the ju justice and everything else comes from that fr fr from it. And it started off, I believe, it started off with, with Abraham. It started off maybe even before with Hammurabi and other cultures. So to, to me, it's very important that the future children, especially Jewish children and others, uh, shouldn't only talk about the Holocaust. Yes, the Holocaust is terribly important, but I think even more important than anything else, they should speak about what Judaism is all about and what is the Jewish culture and what is their empathy, what is their, uh, uh, you know, spirituality and, and what do they contribute towards the world and what have they contributed towards the world and what the world has contributed generally. So it, it's terribly important for me to Pick, to, to not just paint a picture of horror, but to also paint a picture of beauty, a picture of hope, a picture of, you know, of a world that, that, that we would like, the world that, no, God created the world and gave us free, free will. And somebody, you know, I did a New Dimensions and Testimony, which I kind of answer questions from a, from a picture, you know, Shoah Foundation created this new hologram. And, and somebody asked me, do you still believe in God? After God allowed all these things happen. And my answer at the time was, to, to the people that were questioning me, I answered 2000 questions. And of course, now, if you ask me that question to the hologram, it will, you'll get that answer. And I'm going to give you that answer. So they asked me, why did God just not do something about it? I said, God created human beings and gave them free will. So we can do whatever we, we want. We have got an angel of good and an angel of bad in us. And they always strive it. And when God looks down, and look what happened in the Holocaust. God weeps. And I want God to stop weeping. And I want human beings to stop doing, you know, and let the striving inside them, you know, let, let the angel of light to fight the angel of darkness. You know, they, they found the old the Dead Sea Scrolls and it's the sons of light and the sons of darkness were always fighting among, amongst each other to try the better. So I hope that the sons of light, you know, that, the, that, that our children and our future should actually overcome the sons of darkness and create a climate where everybody can exist in peace, in happiness and strive like we all do. I mean, we, we strive for just a normal existence. You know, we, we, we are, all, I mean, I'm a worker and I, all I wanted to do is 
supply my family with, with sufficient victuals to, to have a reasonable good life. And, uh, and that's all I'm asking. I'm not asking for any more. And I think everybody should strive for that. And we should strive very much uh, for, for to, to bring a light into the nations. And, and, to, and, and everybody should do that. Not just the Jewish uh, children, but all children and everywhere. And this is what I do. This is what I try to do. And I hope that it will succeed. Even if it takes a long time, even if it takes a long time, I would like, you know, something to happen. And as I said before, I believe that the world is improving. It's improving very slowly and it will take time, but maybe instead of flying to the moon, we, we will fly, you know, we'll spend all that money for spending, you know, going all over the place. I'm not a great uh, uh, believer in that you should strive and co conquer the whole universe, but I believe that money should be spent better by all these people that have got that money to make you know, humanity, the, 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 the millions of children in Africa and everywhere else who are suffering. And if you look at the pictures, standing, seeing in, 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 in refugee camps and trying to get across to Europe because to have a better life, that, that they should do that. And some of them do, but, the, but too much money is spent on things that I believe are actually uh, not not as worthy. They are all worthy, but not as worthy as trying to help human beings to have a decent life. Alan, what about you? Um, what do you feel like is the biggest takeaway from your perspective as a liberator? What what should the future? What should the children know about and understand about the Holocaust? Well, I agree with what Pinker said. Number one, but. Uh, I uh, I want to I try to reach the young people that I speak to so often uh, uh, about diversity and uh, I remember way back when I went to school played ball and whatever uh, at lunchtime for instance the what we were called the jocks you know the athletes we would sit together uh, the girls maybe in a sorority they would sit in another corner with lunch. Uh, sometimes the, those colored, now called black, would sit by themselves. And I say, I think, uh, I, I make a suggestion often to, to the young people. Next time you go to lunch, uh, for instance, I'll tell one of the ball players, basketball, football, go over to, to, the, to the girls, sit down, say hi, how are you, and start to talk to them and, and, and relate you know, talk just like kids talk to each other. And sometimes uh, you'll find out, I remember once when I was in school, there was a very pretty blonde girl and the other girls all thought she was a, a snob because she never really talked much. Uh, and, you know, she got that reputation and I took it upon myself to sit down and, and sit with her at lunch and found out she was extremely shy, very introverted. And when I came over to speak to her, she was in her glory. Thank you. And then the other kids, well, you know, not that I was a big shop, but they said, oh, Alice, you get... So they came over. Get to meet with each other, speak to each other, learn that we're, you know, you don't make opinions from the outside. And that's what I think diversity is so important. Uh, uh, you know, I said, again, I... I grew up in a very diverse community. And I found out later that many of the younger people, uh, uh, I don't want to single out any areas, but some areas where I live in Westchester County, pretty wealthy people, younger uh, girls, you know, and go, boys grew up in a certain way. And then there's a poor section and they never understood each other until they actually made an effort to go and, and speak and talk to each other, go to each other's homes, uh, and you'll see that we're more alike than different. You know, Maya Angelou, who was uh, one of my favorite people over the years and unfortunately passed away a number of years ago. And she said, among so many things that I remember quoting, but people are more alike than unlike. I like to say people are more alike than different. I learned that in an early age and I try to convey that, you know, when I was in basic training, I went to a lot of stuff in the South, I can tell you, in the 40s, it wasn't pretty in this country. 
when I went down there to hear the, 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 some of the southerners, uh, uh, the language, I'm not gonna repeat some of the language here, but uh, it was rough of uh, the, the anti-Semitism and the obviously racial inequality that uh, uh, call it now called black, couldn't eat at the same restaurant, couldn't go to the same uh, water fountain, restroom. I, that was a shock to me. I grew up with with uh, very diverse up north and in the south. It wasn't like that. And, uh, and I can tell you, I went through a, a few very un unfortunate things that I don't like to talk about too much. But, uh, you know, I put a picture behind my bunk of our basketball team where there were uh, myself, or ca my Catholic buddy, and three colored kids, now called black, with our arms around each other after we, we won the second sectionals in basketball. I love that that picture. I was proud of it. The Southern boys didn't take kindly to that. And they called me a lot of names. One of them, End Lover, uh, you know, uh, um, among other things. And uh, I couldn't, I said, I couldn't, get, the first thing, I was only 18. I couldn't get out of the world this, where this garbage was coming from. Well, if you grow up in a certain area, then that's what you know, you know, that, that so I try to talk to different people now in particular to say that it's very important to understand that we all, what's the color of the blood when you get a cut? I look, show the kids. Red. I said, you, and I point to each kid, red, red. We're more alike than different. And I, I want to get that into their head that it's important to try to mingle and mix and not just go to your own little corner with your one friend. So, you know, try to be more social. And then you'll find out again, as I keep repeating, people are more alike than different. We all feel joy. We all feel pain. Doesn't matter the color of your skin or your religion. Try to be tolerant of each other, to learn and love each other. And now that, you know, I'm a big huggers with the kids. So I, I get a kick out of it now because I get sometimes letters from a, a group in South Jersey that said, after I spoke to Mr. Moskin, we formed a hug, don't hate club in your honor. And, you know, things like that make make me feel that I'm I'm reaching some of the kids and and that's my mantra to uh, get 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 the love out there and forget the hate you know and uh, and I think Pinkus feels the same way hate forgets hate he 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 went through it's a miracle to me that Pinkus is sitting here with so many concentration camps and I think he'll be t telling you all so he's one of the lucky ones and what I saw in the camps at the Gunskirchen concentration camp as a young GI who had been through combat and everything else you know, was such a shock to see living skeletons, uh, you know, the, 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 the skeleton bodies, the emaciated looking human beings. I couldn't believe in my mind that one group of people could treat another group of people like that. It, you know, uh, it, it was just a shock to all of us when we saw that. And, uh, and I, 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 I keep thinking about those those days, and I want to make sure that, you know, what happened back then, uh, never happens again anywhere because uh, you have to see something like that to get the full impact, uh, you know, what what hate does to to people, and that's what I try to do to get the kids to understand that there was a Holocaust, not just with the Jews, but the Armenian thing, other uh, other places learn to understand each other, meet each other, talk to each other, and uh, if necessary, hug each other and get rid of the hate. That's what I try to get to the young people. And that's my mantra. And hopefully if I reach one kid every time I speak in a classroom, the teachers tell me maybe I'm ahead of the game. I hope we do better than that. But uh, I'm, uh, Pinkus and I are both do the best we can as long as we're around uh, to speak to the young people and get them the, the message out that uh, hate begets hate. Learn to understand each other and appreciate each other, and uh, that's about my my talk right now. Thank you, uh, Pinkus, can you share what it was like when the liberators came? What do you remember? What um, what it was like to see the Russians? Did you even know that there was an end? What what were some of your feelings? What are some of your memories from realizing that you will not be in a concentration camp anymore? Well, you know, 
it's like, in a way, you know, thinking about it now, it's like waking up from a nightmare. But at that time, it, being a young boy, very innocent, completely uneducated, my education was Nazi education that you had to make yourself invisible if you, if you want to exist. And, um, but what happened actually is as follows. It's very interesting what happened. On the 8th of May, we woke up in our, they used to have, it, it, Theresienstadt was an old fort, you know, military fort. So they used to call casernas, it's kind of military uh, uh, barracks but they were buildings. And, and so we woke up, we were in bunks, you know, three bunks and I was on top of the bunk and suddenly there was somebody started, we heard screaming, we are free, we are free, we are free. So we got quickly out of our beds and we jumped down and we looked around and the gates were open, the gendarmes had disappeared. And we, those that still could, we ran out to see what was happening. And when we went out, to the, you know, to the road. Uh, there were Russian soldiers, mostly from from the Asian uh, provinces of, of Russia, of the Soviet Union, and they were with blankets, you know, rolled up, bandoliers. This was infantry, and 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 with a with a, another kind of roll of bullets with a Tommy gun, one of these round Russian Tommy guns. And they had big boots, tobacco on one, newspapers on the other. They would roll up these cig big cigarettes, which they do. And they had a piece of bread in one and meat in the other one. They were kind of self-contained little units. Each one of them was a self-contained unit and they were marching. But at the same time, you know that before the war, when Hitler took over Czechoslovakia, he did ethnic cleansing. He chased out Czechs from Moravia, from uh, Bohemia, and he settled many millions of Germans there, or ethnic Germans. And now the Czechs that were liberated by the Russians and the Russians started chasing these people out. And what we saw as the Russian soldiers were going and there were some tanks and others, in between there were a whole lot, thousands of Germans being chased out of Czechoslovakia with little prams, with children, elderly men, very few young men, but young women and children and elderly men. And they were being pushed and shoved and robbed. And I didn't know what was going on. And the soldiers would grab young women because I was innocent. I knew nothing about anything. Being from a religious new, I didn't know what, you know, what sex was all about. But obviously what they were doing, they were grabbing young women and we felt, I mean, I particularly immediately felt empathy toward these people. I felt sorry for them, despite the fact that for five years I suffered under the yoke of the Nazis. I felt these were people that were suffering. These were human beings that were being abused to such an extent that I remember the way we walked when, when we were chased out of Warsaw, when we were chased into the, to Maidane. And, it, and I felt very sorry for them. And I asked some of the other young people and others that were, and they said the same thing. And another beautiful thing happened. I saw a wagon with horses in a field on the other side of the road. And because my maternal grandfather was a farmer and uh, according to tradition, you know, in Poland, they always say there were no Jewish farmers, but there were lots of Jewish farmers and there were a lot of Jewish workers. We were a very a kind of very poor community, basically. There were a few obviously rich people, but the majority were hard workers. So I was used to animals. I was used to horses and I loved horses and cows and chickens and geese and all that because I used to come very often spend time on my grandfather's farm. So I loved horses and I thought I'll go and just pet them and, you know, nuzzle them, you know. Horses have got a very kind of, they, I, even the smell of horses, you know, appeals to you. So I went and I played with these horses and I stayed there and I waited and I thought, well, the, the, the owner will come, but he didn't. So after about a time, I don't remember whether it was an hour or even less or more, 
I woke, I, I went up onto the wagon, I took the whip and I showed the whip to the horses because you don't hit the horse, you just show them the whip. And then I took the reins and I started pulling left and right and they started walking. And I went into Theresienstadt and for the next couple of days, I started going to the farmers collecting food uh, you know, there was there were some soup kitchens that the Russian army bought. They were very good, actually. Uh, but, uh, you know, there was I went to fruit and maybe some other things and I collected it. And then after two days, one of the administrators, Russian and Czechs, they said to me when they saw me with the horses, are these horses yours? I said, yes, yes, they're my horses. So they said, would you like to work for us as a contractor? I said, sure, I'll work for you. I mean, there I was, not even 13 years old, and I became a contractor. But this is the day of liberation. This is the time where you are liberated. But you don't think of that, of that thing. You exist. And, 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 and I started working. And for the three, four months before we were taken by the Royal Air Force to, to England to, uh, for rehabilitation by UNRWA, United, uh, United uh, United Nations Reha Re uh, Relief and Rehabilitation Agency. They, they, you know, I worked for the for, for, for the Czech government, and they gave me a salary of five thousand. The horses became like my family. I, 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 I actually built a stall for them because there were no stalls. So there was a ruin there. I made the stall. I bought hay. I cut hay. I went to Russian surgeons in the kitchen to get, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of things for them. Some of the things like old bread, which I gave them, they didn't agree with the horses, but I tried everything. And I actually slept more time in the stall than I slept in my barrack because they became like my family. So this is the beginning of my life after the war. And then after that, we were taken by the Royal Air Force in, in Wellington bombers. And we, we actually flew to uh, Lake District in, in Windermere, or next to Windermere, a place called Troutberg Bridge, which was an old uh, kind of uh, training ground for officers, for, for uh, you know, British officers. And uh, it was the first time after more than five years that I slept in a little room all to myself with a proper bed and proper bedding. And, uh, and that's how my life started after the war. What was your physical condition like? It sounds like you were fairly healthy. Would you say you were well nourished when, when the liberators came? Um, and, it, and I, I, want, yeah, I want to tell you, as far as I am concerned, and as far as in Theresienstadt, the Russian army, when they arrived there, they brought a field hospital. There was a, 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 a typhoid epidemic in Theresienstadt, and they brought a field hospital with nurses and doctors. They, they created uh, soup kitchens and they brought food and they treated us very, very, very well. They tried their hard. They also tried to make us communists because I remember the, the commanding uh, general once made a, a kind of a, 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 a big speech. He, 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 on the, there was a kind of main place in Theresienstadt in the middle, a huge ground. So he told everybody to come and he was going to make a speech. It was some kind of holiday. And he made a speech and he said, you must all go back to Poland and Russia because communism is this and communism is this. I still remember. He said, za Stalina, za Rodzina, for Stalin and for the motherland. You must all become good communists. Of course, we didn't like the idea. And when they asked us, where do you want to go? I've still got the document from the Czech uh, government, the one before we left. And desired destination, all of us asked, wrote there, Palestina. There was no Israel, but we knew Palestine. We knew that Palestine was a place of the Jews. So we all wrote Palestina. And that's, that, that is what I was striving at the time. We, we, we wanted to start a new life and we wanted to be in Palestine. We didn't want to go back to Poland. We didn't, we knew Poland was just a graveyard, a place where they, you won't find anybody. I mean, I knew that my parents, I had a family, an extended family of close to 150 or 200 people uh, across Poland. I had great uncles. I had uh, great cousins. I had cousins. I had, uh, uh, you know, my father had, had five siblings, 
and they all had children. And I remember how what wonderful holidays we had, and they all disappeared. Most of them were in the Wuj ghetto, and they were all murdered in Hamdo. My grand, my my grandfather, Ichimaya Guta, who was 78 years old when the war started, he finished up in the ghetto. And when I went back to Wuj and tried to find out what happened to him, and because they had all records in, in Wuj, so I went to the Jewish Community Council and I found that one. My great, my grandfather, Itzek Maya Guta, was on the first transport that was sent out from the Warsaw Ghetto, from the Muj Ghetto, to Helmno to be murdered by the Nazis. And by that time, he must have been about 80 years old. Can you imagine the hurt, the feeling, the emotions that went through to me when I saw on that piece of paper in the Jewish Community Council? They have actually got records. Because in the in the Woj ghetto, everything was done, you know, written out. They they kind of when they were deporting people, it wasn't like in Warsaw where they just surrounded blocks and they took them to the to the Umschlagplatz and sent them to Treblinka to die without names or anything. But there, it was done kind of well. So they put down the names. So I found my grandfather and most of my family you know, were murdered in Helmdor. And those that were left over and were still working were sent to Auschwitz. Only five cousins and myself survived the war, five cousins. And three of them were hidden by Christian Catholics in, in Warsaw on the Aryan side. A family, a cousin of mine, my father's, uh, my, my father's eldest sister, daughter, her husband and a child, were hidden by wonderful people who risked their life to save them. And so three of them were saved by Polish Christians. And two of them survived Auschwitz. Leibel and Schifra survived Auschwitz. And I survived all these camps, which I told you about. I survived Majdanek, Skarzysko, Częstochowa, Buchenwa, Kolditz, Terezinstadt. Oh boy. Um, thank you, Pinkas. Um, from, from your perspective, Alan, and then of course, Pinkas, um, as you watched the horror um, as a liberator going in, and as you mentioned earlier, the emaciated bodies and you know, just watching um, what, what conditions there were, uh, what, what were you, um, what, what were your feelings? What, what was your initial reaction in terms of, you know, having this incredible task of liberating and, and watching this horror kind of now un, unfold in a different way in terms of liberation? Um, what were some of your initial um, memories as you think back as a young person uh, watching children, um, maybe, uh, you know, adults uh, in, in various conditions in terms of health? Uh, what what were your some of your feelings? What were some of your tasks? What did you first do, Alan? Well, first of all, let me say that we were completely in shock. Um, my officers, my captain, my lieutenant, none of us knew about, I emphasize this, none of us knew about concentration camps. We knew that Hitler didn't like Jews and uh, uh, but we, you know, communication wasn't like it is today, by the way, back in the, you know, many years ago. And uh, when we came across the Gunskirchen Lager uh, and saw these, the, uh, the emaciated living skeletons, we were in shock. We all looked at each other. I remember my lieutenant kept screaming, oh, my God, look at these poor souls. What is this? Who are these people? We didn't even know who they were at first until we finally, uh, some of them had a Jewish star that was pinned up on the top of their uh, pajamas or whatever their uniforms were. And then he starts screaming, hey, Moskin, you knew I was Jewish. They must be Jewish. Uh, and he asked me if I could speak anything in Yiddish or so-and-so. And I was able to spot out Ish bin al-Chayud. Ishbin al Chayud. And uh, I mean, if, if they weighed 75 pounds, it was a lot. They were like 
I always remember their arms and legs looked like broomsticks with no flesh. Their cheeks were all hollowed out. Their eyes sunken back into the sockets of their head. Sores all over the body. The stench it was any liberator will tell you the first thing that hits you was the smell. I understand that the, the poor souls, my lieutenant kept saying, oh my God, these poor souls, and I repeated, uh, they didn't smell, but we did from the outside. The stench was so overpowering. It's a smell that you can never forget. And, uh, and then I tell the story all the time when I saw this on the side of the, the, the path of the roadway, there were three of these poor souls with the bark of a tree that they had gotten and they were digging it into the guts of a dead horse, a dead horse and pulling out the entrails of a dead horse and biting and chewing and seeing the blood squirt. I mean, this is graphic, but you see something like this, you realize what starvation does to people. I mean, it was shocking. It was shocking to us. And I remember uh, handing out our uh, C and K rations, you know, spam or whatever we had, where many of them were saying, Essen bitte, Essen bitte, Wasser bitte. And when many of them would grab the, the C and K rations that we had and started to chew, but they would start to grab their, uh, their esophagus, you know, the windpipe. They were choking. They couldn't, and they apparently were falling to the ground. And then the medics came up and screamed, no solid food, damn it, no, because apparently we weren't doctors, but when you're starving, you, you can't swallow right away, but we didn't know that. So I want you to get the picture. You're trying to help. You're handing out food. And there are many of them were choking. And, and when you see when you see inmates with the bark of a tree digging it into a dead horse and pulling the guts of a dead horse and biting and seeing the blood, and this is graphic, you realize what starvation does to people. You have to see it. And then when I went into the, the, what they call the barracks, an upper and a lower for thousands of meters, dead bodies all over. You could hardly stay in there. The stench from the dead was so powerful. And many of them were, were sitting on, on dead bodies. And, and I remember them uh, closing their eyes and praying to God and saying, uh, help me, help me, help me. If they weighed 70, 75 pounds, it was a lot. I mean, we weren't prepared for something like this. We didn't know anything about that. I remember my captain was screaming in a walkie-talkie to the rear, get help up here, damn it, get, there's people dying as I talk. She's trying to get help from the rear. These are the things that I remember that I can never forget. And, uh, and then I remember this elderly man, when I, when, uh, I, I said, Ich bin al -Khayud. I said, Ishmael al Chayud, when the captain said, Anybody speak, anybody Jewish here? I think it was just myself and one other Jewish boy that was in the outfit. When I said I was an American Jewish soldier, this man, he, was, he looked like a skeletal, you know, his arms and his legs were like, also like broomsticks. It was so, the cheeks were hot. He's, for the first time, when I said I was an American Jewish soldier and we'll try to take care of them, that and, you know, bring help and bring medical help. He went down on his hands and knees in front of me. I wasn't sure what he was going to do. And then he started to, to kiss my boots. My boots were caked with blood and feces and, and, and mud and who knows what. I didn't like it because I never had anybody grovel at my feet like that. And I picked him up under the armpit, armpits. And as he came up toward me, he put his arms around me like this. And then I remember looking at the back, the neck, nape of his neck all the way back. There were open, pussy, festering sores. Now, I know this is graphic and the smell. And the, when you see something like that, he was crying and saying, Danka, Americana, you the Danka. You can't forget something like that. Uh, it's, 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 you know, I had nightmares about that for a long time. Fortunately, most of that is dissipated. But I, when I talk about it, I still feel it. Uh, I we just couldn't get a handle on it. I mean, uh, that people were, had been treated like this. And uh, I always say anybody that survived what we saw, to me, it's a, I've come across now uh, over the years, a few people that were in Gunskirchen when I speak. And 
And you know, obviously it's a very emotional thing. And you know, Danka, Danka, thank you, thank you. But any anybody I think is that survived the, the hell and the horror of the, the concentration camps is a miracle. And uh, uh, I was just a young 18 year old American GI who was doing what I thought was the right thing to do as a, you know, we were all very patriotic back then. I like to tell the young people today, you know, we didn't have to be forced to go fight for the country. We loved the country. Guys were running to the to the to the draft board when Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. I wish I could bring back some of that that patriotism that we had in World War II that were fighting for this country. But uh, God, I hope uh, if there's a God up there that what we saw in those concentration camps it never happens again. It's just it's so hard to even talk about. Uh, let alone experience it, what Pincus went through and so many others. And uh, and looking at Pincus to me, it's, uh, he's a miracle to me, the, the way he he looks and talks. And uh, uh, not too many came out of that those those camps. And uh, uh, I again repeat, hate begets hate. I don't want to see any hate anywhere. I saw it with my own eyes, and uh, I want the young people to know there was a Holocaust. There was no myth. Some of these people get me sick to my stomach trying to say that the Jews made it up, the Jews exaggerated it. I bear witness. When I speak to the kids, I want them to bear witness for me when I'm gone and tell their children and their grandchildren that there was a Holocaust. They got to make damn sure that it never, ever happens again. And uh, that's, uh, I get emotional because it's an emotional subject. But uh, that's that's the way I feel about it. And hopefully that I can continue when this lousy pandemic is over that I get back to the schools because I like to see the kids and and you know and, and hug the kids and, and, and connect with the kids. There's virtual, okay, it's a substitute. I'm not into that zoom boom doom stuff, but but uh let's let's hope that this pandemic ends sooner than later and, and Pinkus and I can both get back into the schools. I'm sure he feels the same way I do. The contact, to look at the kids. When I tell them some of these things, their eyes open up and they look and say, oh my God, you know, I want them to feel the, the, the horror and the pain that, I, that we witnessed and make sure that it never happens again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as, as we, um, you know, look, look at the time right now, it's a little 10 after 11. I want to make sure that we are, um, uh, opening questions um, and make sure that you type in your questions in the chat box so that we are collecting them. And um, Deborah and Debbie will be asking those questions uh, for the next 20 minutes. And as I hand this over to them, the one question that I do have for Pinkas and also for Alan is how do you get past the anger? How do you get past uh, the 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 rage perhaps, um, as you have experienced what you just shared uh, and move to this place of, uh, you know, spreading this hope of lightness and love and uh, how, how, how did you do that? And, you know, having survived the camps for you, Pinkas, how do you, how do you manage that? I think my anger, if there any, uh, if I ever had one, dissipated, and I told you when we were liberated, and I saw German, hum German people being chased out and suffering. And I looked at that, and I'm sure that something actually happened, that I really was never angry. I am one of those people that believes, and there are many people, others, that the death penalty should never, ever be handed out. I believe that a human being should not be killed by other human beings. I believe that when it does, it's judicial murder. I believe that one shouldn't forget, and I don't even believe one should forgive the perpetrators of what they do when they create a climate when there is such iniquity and such suffering. But they should be judged by a court of law, a proper court of law, and if found guilty, they should be locked up 
in a small cell as an example of what happened to people. And it's kind of almost like the other side of witnesses or perpetrators. This is what happens to people that do these type of things. But I also want to share you something else, what Ellen experienced. When I was 14 years old, I decided I didn't want to be in an orphanage and I didn't, I wanted to, I was independent thinking, I don't know why. And I wanted to start working. So I started working and I boarded with a family. And I started working in a factory where they, make, where they were making spectacle frames, frames, you know, spectacle frames. And there was a quota. You had to, every, I used to earn three pound 10, I was, it's in England. And I used to earn three pounds and 10 shillings. Three pounds I gave to my lady who board, where I used to board at the, the home with the family, the Jewish family. And 10 shillings I kept for myself for everything. But the quota was such that if you went over the quota, in other words, if you went one, two, four, five percent, they gave you some extra money. And being a stupid young child, not knowing what would create, I started working as fast as I could and, and I used to get much more. And I would get every week, I would get maybe 10 shillings extra or a pound extra. And the next thing is lunchtime, we used to go down and play soccer. And the next thing is I was started, they started beating me out. And the foreman called me into his little office and he said, Peter, because they used to call me Peter. Pinchas was too much for them. So they used to call me Peter. So he said, Peter, I know you're a good worker and I appreciate it, but don't work too hard because that means that everybody else has got too hard. And they, they already started me, that dirty Jew. He's trying to, you know, do all these things, you know. He's always going to be better than everybody else. So I just want to share this with uh, Alan uh, because he had also the same experience when he was in the army or whatever. But that's not the end of it. I mean, you, you, what you wanted to just remind me what you just asked me because I kind of went off tangent. Mm. <laughs> um, what, just, what did just you actually how, ask me to say? <laughs> my, my question was more focused on how can you get past the rage, the anger, yeah, yeah. what well, happened to you and your family and be the, so the hopeful. Thing, the thing is this, that when, when, you, when, when you are, when you are a, a young person, it's, I think it's easier. The first 10 years of my life in England and in other places, I never ever spoke about the Holocaust or knew anything or, or thought about it. I only had in Paris when I was working in a textile factory at the age of 15 and 16, or 16 actually, um, uh, because I was in England for about two and a half years, and then I went to, to France when I found my cousins and I worked in a little textile factory. I had a dream that I was being gassed. So I started screaming. They heard, and both my cousins, Anja, they slept in a very large bed and they took this little boy who wasn't such a little boy and put them inside, they calmed him down. And the next day I forgot about it. For the first 10 years, I had no dreams at all about or anything like that, except that one happening. And vengeance, and it, it, my, my father and my grandfather were very good people. They always, they were very charitable. I'll give you an example. My grandfather, and I remember that quite clearly because we had this joint little two apartment. When he would leave his, uh, uh, his little apartment to go to work, he would take up all his short change, and there were a lot of beggars, Jewish beggars and other beggars, and he would put it. And he would say to his wife, he says, if anybody rings the bell, you just give them the, uh, the money, give them five groceries or something like that. And when you, when you run out of the small change, and if they are hungry, you must give them some bread. And that stayed with me. So I have always been somebody who didn't believe. My father used to bring people to the little apartment. We had a little apartment in Warsaw in the ghetto, which was the size of a schoolroom. You know, half of it was a bedroom and the other half was a kitchen. So my father made wine to make a living because he was a winemaker. You know, and he put two stills there and things like that. But he always used to bring people from the street to sleep at night in the kitchen. So to me, you know, 
anger and 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 uh, rage was completely foreign to me it, it it it's it's goodwill it's something that i think is it, it's ingrained in me and i i've never felt it and i'm trying to kind of impart that to other people when i when i come up to schools or wherever i speak to people generally i try to impart that emotions and feeling that they should actually do the same that they should not feel anger that should not vengeance is something which shouldn't exist and you remember i told you about the flame and so forth and so on and this is how i you know so to me anger and vengeance no justice in the bible there's only one commandment that is repeated twice justice justice you should it's the only one and justice means lots of things. It means charity in, in Hebrew. It means charity. It means other things. So basically, it's it's all the good things, and it's repeated twice. Only other, no other commandment is repeated twice immediately. But it says, "Your tzedek, 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 justice, justice, you shall pursue." And that's the only one. And I believe very much in that. It's um, just simply. Uh... So inspiring to hear both of you, um, given what you've experienced, how hopeful you remain, how you continue to promote the idea of love and peace uh, and togetherness and justice. Uh, so it's, it's truly humbling and extremely inspiring. And I'm so glad that you are able to connect with uh, not only all of us here today, but as you go around and speak with young people, uh, it, it hopefully will take away any cynicism given the current climate that we're uh, living in um, and, and, you know, make sure that this message that you're spending of this flame um, of, of beauty and hope and the wow. fact that it's the Jewish values um, that, that are such human values uh, that need to continue to be promoted. Um, there was a question from the audience or a request from the audience about what you, um, Alan, as a liberator would directly say to Pinkhas and what, Pinkas, you would say to Alan as a liberator directly? Well, I could only say to Pinkas, um, it's a miracle. I'm looking at somebody that went through so many concentration camps like Pinkas did. <clears throat> and looking at him, you would never know it. I mean, uh, uh, he's, a, he's a miracle walking as far as, <laughs> and sitting as far as I'm concerned. Let me just say, I see a, a message here, and I want to answer it. One of the, uh, what branch of the military did this gentleman serve in? And I can just respond to that by saying, uh, I served with the 66th Infantry Regiment, 71st Infantry Division, part of the famous Third Army, which was led by the one and only General George S. Patton. You'll have to have me come back. I could talk an hour about, <laughs> about General Patton. I want to just tell you one thing. Uh, militarily, we we love General Patton. He was a tough old bird, but uh, you know, every, more four-letter words than I ever heard. And, uh, but uh, the one thing that really shook us up, I'm smiling because I still get a kick out of thinking about it. We thought first he was jesting, but he kept looking at us all and, 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 and saying, hey, you guys, you know who you're looking at? You're looking at Napoleon. So... We was, we, what, do you, what do you mean we look at the report? Then he would say next day he was some general in the Roman Empire. And finally, we realized that General Patton, you know, believed in reincarnation seriously. And he thought that he had come back as Napoleon or, you know, when you're a young 18 year old GI fighting, you respect your general, and he's telling you he, he's Napoleon, you get a little, a little shook up. Well, I laugh at it now because he really devoutly uh, read later that he, he strongly believed in reincarnation and that he had come back as those old time uh, generals. But um, uh, just to add a little bit to what Pink has said, I mean, uh, uh, I don't have anger. Uh, I, I, I served as a member of the Army of Occupation after the war and, and, and met a lot of people in Germany and Austria. A lot of good people. There are good people everywhere. Uh, uh, what happened, happened. I don't want to dwell on it. 
what I'm what I'm anxious to make it make sure that what happened then never happens again. That's my man. I'm not going to dwell on what happened back then and why, who, what uh, it happened, and uh, we're good people and bad people in every country to tell you the truth. But uh, uh, my <laughs> Chris is, is pointing out to another question here: Was Patton empathetic to the survivors? Well. Let me put it this way. I I never had personal knowledge of what I was told later, that General Patton was not very happy with the uh, the, con the the camps that were set up for the survivors, uh, uh, you know, after the war ended, that he made remarks. I have no knowledge about that, but I did hear that uh, uh, he, he, he wasn't too happy with a lot of what's going on with the survivors and what was being set up, that's for somebody else to, to answer because I, you know, I had no no knowledge of that. I'm not going to get into that element of whether Patton, you know, was anti-Semitic or he wasn't. Uh, I I only know I fought under Patton as a, as a soldier. He was a tough old guy. We followed him and and uh, and I think he was a good uh, good soldier as far as his personal beliefs and thoughts. I can't I can't speak to that because you know I never had any personal knowledge of that. I did hear later that that he wasn't that fond about a lot of the concentration camps and the Jews being in there and whatever. But that's for somebody else to talk about. But I want to end by saying I appreciate Kieran and uh, the rest, Deborah, of having having us here. Uh, uh, the more we can get out to the young people in particular, that there was a Holocaust. Uh, Pincus and I bear witness, and I think we both feel strongly that hate begets hate, not to hate and to love each other and hug each other. And that, uh, you know, we all feel joy, we all feel sadness, and no matter what the color of your skin or your religion is, and uh, try to get to, to, to meet other people, particularly in the schools. I tell the young people, sit with people and talk to them, get to know each other, and you'll find out what I'm talking about. That. People are more alike than different. Uh, and hopefully one day to, well, there'll, come, there'll come a day when all God's children, black, white, pink, yellow, Jew, Catholic, Protestant, uh, Muslim, all God's children can live in a world filled, filled with joy and happiness and, and love and not, not with hate. I think Pinkus both feel strongly about that. Thank you, Alan. Pinkus, any, any last words? Well, you know, I can't feel sufficiently grateful to all the armed forces, especially to people like Ellen, who, you know, risked their lives, went to fight against the Nazis and tried to liberate us. And when you, when you think about it, Tens of thousands of these liberators didn't really make it. They gave their life and they gave their life so that others could live. And I am eternally grateful to people like Alan and, um, and, and, other, and all the others from all the armed forces in, in the world who fought in the Second World War and who tried to do away with this vicious Nazi ideology and, and, and the viciousness that went on. And the one thing I actually want to add is that I want to paint for you a scene which is very important, how it is possible to ingrain into human beings things that should not be done. When we were walking on the march of death and we were walking from Kolditz to Czechoslovakia, when we went through villages and towns where in Germany, they threw stones at us. They, this was the end of the war. The war was ending and they still threw stone at us. They, shouted at us. They, they said that you didn't, you should be all dead. You did, I mean, you can't imagine how, how we were treated 
by the population of these towns and villages. We, we, we couldn't believe it, that, that, that these were just ordinary people and they threw stones at us. We were emaciated, we were dying, but they still harangued us. As soon as we crossed the border and we came to Czechoslovakia, the Czechs started throwing food from their windows. And what do you think our guards did? They started shooting in the air and they said, if you don't stop, we're gonna shoot you. We're gonna kill you. The difference between what you teach people, and I think that the Nazis managed to get to, to actually bring about a climate in Germany where they taught people to become so hateful. And I think that's something we must be warned about. This is something that we must, when you look at the populism today, when you look at the nationalism, the isolation and what is going through in many countries today in the world all over, it is a warning. It is a warning that we must not take easily. We should pay great attention and do something about it. Thank you. Um, thank you for your courage. Thank you for your resilience. Um, thank you for being here today and being so forthcoming about your experience and sharing what it was like and to offer this message of hope and light and, and love. Um, we can't thank you enough. There's messages from everybody that is um, participating today to thank both of you for your time and for your continued commitment uh, to talking about what happened and learning from it and passing the message to future generations so that it never happens again. Uh, so I wanna thank everybody today for being here, for your support, um, of course, of Jessa, of um, you know, uh, coming here and supporting Pinkas and Alan um, as we hear their stories uh, and to make sure that we do what we can uh, to make sure that something like this never happens again. Uh, so thank you, um, Pinkas. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank and you. we look forward to further conversations with you. And thank you all for coming to this event um, at JASA. We really appreciate all of you being here today. Thank you very much. And uh, good goodbye, good health. Look after yourself and make sure you don't get COVID. That's the most important. <laughs> <laughs> I keep on saying to everybody, get vaccinated. I don't understand. I mean, I've got a, a mad grandson who doesn't want to be vaccinated. He lives in the United States, he works there, he's married, he's now got a, a you know, a, 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 I've got a great grandson and they don't want to be vaccinated. They caught COVID, but they are okay now. But, but for some reason, don't ask me why. And I think it's terribly important to, to stay safe, stay healthy and look after yourself and good luck. And, Thank you so much. Thank and shalom. You. Hello. Hello. Yes. <laughs>